Good afternoon. Let me welcome you to our seventh bioelectrodynamics webinar. And before we start, I would like to give you some technical details. Um, I would like to ask you to switch off your video and keep muted during the talk. And if you will have any questions, I uh, will prefer to that you save them and either type them to the chat or, or you can raise the hand after the presentation and ask, uh, we, can, we can unmute you and you can ask yourselves. Uh, we plan to record the lecture as well as Q&A session and after approval uh, of the speaker, we will we'll put it online if it's okay. Then we expect that the talk will be roughly 45 minutes. And I would like to also announce that this webinar is supported by the International Union of Radio Science and Engineering in Medicine and Biology chapter of Czechoslovakia section of IEEE. And so today um, we have the honor to host uh, Professor Patrick Sennett, who is a full professor of physics at the University of, uh, of Bourgogne, Franche Comte. And that's in Dijon, in France, uh, where he joined the faculty in 2001. Uh, he received his PhD degree um, from the Namur University and then completed a research day um, in the Max Planck Institute for Dynamic and Self Organization in Göttingen. And furthermore, he was also a research fellow in several research funds in, again, Namur University and also at the University of Antwerp, both in Belgium and also in the University of Montpellier in France. Um, he later on, he was also on, on a sabbatic leave at Cornell University at the professor of the group of Professor Sharaga, and he's still a visiting scholar at the Cornell University since that time. His current interests, as you could see from an uh, advertisement of this talk, uh, are mostly with uh, protein dynamics, conceptual density functional theory, protein folding and misfolding diseases, also time series analysis and protein sequencing, sequencing by nanopores. So with this, I would like to welcome um, Patrick Sennett, Professor Sennett, and I would give him, like to give space to him, please. Thank you very much uh, for the invitation. So uh, I'm pleased to give you uh, this introduction to protein dynamics that uh, the work we are doing in, uh, in uh, Dijon. And first, I would like to introduce you shortly my university, University of Bourgogne Franche Comte, and my laboratory. So I am in, in Dijon, which is in the region called Bourgogne Franche Comte, which is well known for wine, the Bourgogne, and cheese. And the University of Bourgogne Franche Comte is a university with two main colleges in Dijon and Besançon, with about 60,000 students and about 400 PhD per year. And it hosts uh, about 60 laboratories. So I am from a laboratory which is interdisciplinary between physics, chemistry, and a part of biology. It's mainly physics, with an international master in physics, and also is a co-leader of International Graduate School in Physical Science, which in part supports us. Okay, so now I will move to my talk. Uh, which is uh, protein dynamics from normal mode analysis to free energy landscape. And uh, I, first, I will introduce you uh, to acoustical modes of protein and what we uh, understand by acoustical modes. Then um, I will show you normal modes applied to uh, one, one example, the conformational dynamics of a nanomachine, which is HSP70, which is a chaperon protein. And another point of view is the free energy landscape point of view and the conformational dynamics, which is um, a non-harmonic point of view. And finally, short conclusions. So as you know, a, a protein solution is very flexible. So in fact, there is no one structure of a protein, one native state of a protein, but in fact, it's an ensemble of structure as it's a minimum of a free energy. So, and the protein is moving from one a local minima to another. So, in fact, we can very simply uh, make a picture of the free energy of a protein as, as a function of some conformational coordinates. And we have global minima, like the folded state, so the native state, and for example, the unfolded state, because a protein has a finite probability to unfold in solution. And within this global minima, you can course, define local minima corresponding to different small motion of a part of the protein or side chain. 
In each of these local minima, of course, you can make an expansion. In principle, it's an expansion of the free energy, but in the calculation, we are making an expansion uh, to the second order of the potential energy, which is uh, different, but in general, the minimum of the potential energy coincides, but not always with the minimum of the free energy. So the idea is the idea of NMA, which is simply the harmonic approximation, so the expansion of the Hamiltonian to the second order. And this is the one way to study uh, the motion, local motion of the system in the different possible local minima of the protein. So why we are talking about acoustical mode of proteins? I mean, name this mode acoustical mode because they are low frequency mode. A low frequency mode have large amplitude. Indeed, if you have a mode with a low frequency, for the same mass, it means that the force constant is, of course, uh, lower, and so the amplitude of motion is larger. So this mode with a large amplitude are the modes which are the most important for biological function, because the biological function of many proteins involve large conformational chain. So they are driving in part by low frequency mode. But the question is to know how is low the frequency of the mode. And it's possible to do a very simple calculation of the order of magnitude of the frequency of this acoustical mode. So imagine that the global protein, any global protein with a radius of about 10 nanometer, then you know that the largest wavelength will be approximately two times the radius uh, for any waves propagating in, in, in the, this elastic sphere. So if you know the velocity of sound in the material and the velocity of sound of longitudinal waves in protein is about 2000 meters per second, and the velocity of sound for transverse wave is about 700 meters per second. So if you know the velocity of these acoustical waves, you can estimate the frequency of the longitudinal and transverse wave in this very simple calculation. And you got a frequency which is between 45 gigahertz to 100 gigahertz. So it means that the low frequency mode, the lowest frequency mode of a protein should be of the order of magnitude. So this is a simple calculation based on the velocity of sound measure in a crystal of a protein. But what about experimental evidence, evidences of these of this acoustical modes? In fact, there is an old measurement of acoustical mode in collagen. Uh, and by brilliant scattering, uh, it was observed a longitudinal acoustical mode with a frequency of about 10 gigahertz. Of course, it's a fiber, so I can expect that the, the frequency will be even lower than the, the previous calculation, which was based on the globular uh, model. Another uh, spectra, brilliant spectra for another fiber protein, gave the same order of magnitude for the lowest frequency acoustical mode in this uh, uh, fibril protein. But in fact, the first clear evidence of acoustical mode in globular protein was published quite recently in 2015 by the group of Gordon in uh, one paper, Nature Photonics. And to my knowledge, the best of my knowledge, there was no, there, there is still no other uh, experimental evidences of uh, very low uh, frequency mode in this, this type of globular protein. So what they found, they measured the, the low, lowest frequency mode of a protein by trapping the protein in a nano hole. And you see that it, the nano hole is between two bigger hole here, it's a small gap here. So they trap a protein, in principle a single protein, and they apply an electric field which has a frequency which is below 300 gigahertz and which is obtained by interference between two optical lasers. And then they measure the root mean square fluctuation of the position of the protein as a function of the frequency of this electric field. And they observed resonance. So, for example, for this protein, 
uh, with this shape, conalbumin, which is the last was the largest one study, you see that you observe three peaks with a frequency in the range uh, between about 20 gigahertz to 80 gigahertz. The first peak uh, is about 26 gigahertz. So again, you have the same order of magnitude that the simple calculation I, I just shown before. So this is reasonable uh, order of magnitude for the acoustical mode of proteins. But the problem is to understand what means, in fact, uh, what means these peaks, which mode are excited, and what is the mechanism of exciting in this experiment? So it's why we did normal mode uh, calculation with a classical force field for these three proteins. And uh, these proteins were relaxed by molecular dynamic simulation at 300 K. And then we, I mean, froze, in fact, the structure uh, in, in the dynamics. And we kept the water molecule around the protein because, of course, uh, the protein in solution is always surrounded by water molecules which interact quite strongly with the different side chain of the system. So it makes no sense to compute, for example, the normal mode of the protein without including some, some water molecules to, to our opinion. And so this is the calculation we did. And we compute the infrared spectra using simply a classical force harmonic oscillator. So the spectra, the infrared spectra, is just proportional to the change of the dipole moment of the mode which is excited. And you have the calculation for the three proteins, for example, conalbumin. This is the infrared spectra computed from the normal mode calculation. We see that you can see that we have three peaks. In the experiment, you observe also three peaks, but here it's not an infrared spectra, but this is the fluctuation of the protein in the optical trap. So you have a resonance at some frequency. It means that some frequency, the protein, something happens to the protein, I would say. And there is some coincidence between the calculation and, and the experiment, except that there is a rigid shift. So you see that the first peak is about 26 gigahertz, and we are more around uh, 50, 55 gigahertz. So there is a rigid shift between the spectrum, uh, uh, theoretical spectrum, and the experimental one. And for this protein, we observe one peak in the experiment also. And for this protein, in the, in the experimental paper, there was only one single measurement compared to the others where the experiment was uh, repeated. And we have reasonable agreement, I would say, for the last, last case. So first, we observe that normal mode calculation, even if a simple calculation of the infrared spectra, seems to be in agreement with the experimental measurement of this low frequency mode, which means that the low frequency mode are in fact infrared active. What is interesting also that we observe that uh, the change of the dipole moment, so the contribution to the change of the dipole moment of the mode, is mainly due to the blue dots, which represent, in fact, the positively charged amino acid lysine and arginine. The black dots are the amino acids which are not charged, and the red dots correspond to the amino acids which are negatively charged. Surprisingly, and we observe this for different proteins, the positively charged amino acids are the ones which are the most contributing to the change of the dipole moment in this low frequency mode. But, okay, at these low frequencies, we, accept also, we expect also that the molecule will be deformed, and we expect global change of the shapes, so we expect also change of the volume of the protein. If we have a change of the volume of the protein, then we expect that a change of the polarizability of the molecule, and maybe a possibility to excite the molecule and the vibration mode of the molecule by Raman spectroscopy. Is what we check. So in Raman spectroscopy, the, the intensity is proportional to the derivative of the polarizability relative to the normal coordinate. So you need to have a change of the global polarizability of the system when the mode is excited. 
if you if you derive the probability relative to the volume of the system, so I use a chain rule here of derivative, and knowing, and that was demonstrated by ab initio calculation, one of our previous works in a different context, knowing that the probability of an amino acid is proportional to its volume, then it means that this uh, derivative is in fact a constant, it's a linear relation, and so we got uh, the, the possibility to compute the intensity of Raman excitation just using a normal mode uh, analysis with the calculation of this property, which is the derivative of the polarizability relative to the volume of the amino acid, so to the volume of the protein. And doing this calculation, we observe again that the three modes which are observed in the experiment occur also in, in the calculation. At least we have three similar modes and the same for this protein, which would mean that these acoustical modes are both infrared active and Raman active. Of course, these proteins don't have any particular symmetry, so we can expect that the mode can be infrared active and Raman active. There is no reason that this could not be possible. So with this normal mode calculation, which are very simple calculation, of course, we observe a rigid shift to, between theory and experiment, which can be explained because the, we don't uh, take into account completely the full solvent and the full environment of the system. But with this simple calculation, we observe some coincidence between the experimental uh, measurement and uh, the calculation. And we have maybe a, a possibility to explain the mechanism of excitation. At least we make a, an hypothesis uh, because you have an electric field which is oscillating at a frequency below 300 gigahertz, which, which excite infrared uh, active mode. So you create a change of dipole moment. And you also uh, induce a variation of the molecular polarizability of the molecule because this uh, infrared active mode is also Raman active. So it induces a change of the polarizability of the molecule, the global polarizability of the molecule. And the molecule is, of course, uh, maintained in an optical trap. And the optical trap, in fact, and the motion of the molecule in the optical trap depends on its polarizability. So if you change the polarizability of the molecule, you can also move the molecule and maybe that's the link between the fluctuation of the molecule observed at some resonance frequency in the range of the acoustical mode. And, um, uh, and this could explain, in fact, the mechanism of excitation, which is still uh, debated. So this is, a, uh, this is the, a representation uh, simply uh, of uh, this low uh, frequency acoustical mode. So they have a characteristic in common. They all correspond to torsional modes. Of course, the diadral angle uh, between the, the different amino acids along the chain of the protein are the most fluctuating degrees of freedom at room temperature. So it's not surprising that the lowest uh, frequency mode correspond, in fact, to torsional modes. So this is the, in fact, uh, what theory could, could propose, in fact, as interpretation of the peak observed in this experiment. So now we have applied normal mode uh, analysis to three globular proteins. Uh, these proteins have nothing uh, special. I would mean they're just the globular protein and we are just observing the fluctuation around the the global, uh, in fact, minimum of the folded state. But there are many situations where the, the life of a protein is more, much more complicated. In fact, for many proteins, uh, there is no one global native state, but several native states. In fact, many proteins interact with ligands. And by interacting, interacting with ligands, they can move from one global minimum to another Another example of a complicated life of a protein is moving to a native state to a misfolded state because, of course, because of the Boltzmann law, 
uh, protein can escape the global minimum and move to a local minima and stay for kinetic reasons a long time there. So, in fact, uh, the normal mode analysis does not give you all the story of, of the dynamics of the system, but you have to take into account also jump between different uh, minimum minima. And an example of a, a protein with a two uh, main native state is the protein HSP17, it's short protein, which is a chaperone protein. It's a huge protein for the calculations, it's 10 nanometer long, it's more than 600 amino acid. And the main role of this chaperone is to refold a protein which are misfolded or unfolded. So this protein, of course, because uh, it's directly connected to folding, misfolding, is related to misfolding disease and also to cancer disease. This protein has two domains, one nuclear binding domain where ATP or ADP uh, is bound, and a substrate binding domain where an unfolded protein can bind. And this substrate binding domain is decomposed in two parts, a beta and alpha parts, which can be close to each other, and we will say that the protein is close, or these two can be distant, and then we will say that the protein is an open state. So when the protein is bound to ATP, then the open state is the most stable. When the protein is bound to ADP, the closed state is the most stable. <coughs> Sorry. And we can represent the structure schematically of these two states. The open state corresponds to an ATP molecule inside the nuclide binding domain and the substrate binding domain open. And so you can have fast exchange between this domain and the unfolded system. When it's closed, ADP is bound and the substrate binding domain is closed. So you have slow exchange between unfolded uh, system and, and the protein. So now you, you have two main states. And the first idea is to compute the normal mode, so the lowest acoustical mode of these two states, because this lowest frequency mode are the mode normally which have the largest amplitude. And then we can expect that they help or they initiate uh, conformational change from one open state to a closed state and vice versa. So that's the motivation, looking at the acoustical mode of a system which can move from one global minimum to another and see if they give the direction of, of change. <coughs> Sorry. So to compute the normal mode of this system, you can use two different techniques. The all atom normal mode analysis with a classical force field. So you have, for this case, about 30,000 uh, normal modes. Again, you see that our model is always a protein surrounded by water. Or you can, you can use a very popular simplify model, which is the anisotropic elastic network model. In this model, you have only two parameters. One parameter, which is the distance between two nodes of the elastic model, and an harmonic force constant, which is the same between all the nodes, which is fitted on the mean square fluctuation obtained, for example, by X-ray diffraction. So this is a kind of engineering model. And why it's, it's relevant here is because if you are looking at the lowest frequency mode, in terms of physics, they correspond to large wavelength. And at large wavelength, you don't see the details. You don't see the atomic structure of the system. And so there is a hope that this model can catch the low frequency mode of the system. So the all atom calculation gave two different uh, low uh, frequency mode. The lowest frequency mode of the open state is 24 gigahertz, and the lowest frequency mode of the closed states is 37 gigahertz. So there is a huge difference, a significant difference between the lowest part of the spectra for these two states. 
If you compare now the two theoretical, theoretical methods, so the whole atom and the elastic model, you can see that both agree. So I mean the simplified coarse grain model, elastic model, can give you good answer up to about 300 gigahertz. So for this part of the spectra, you are allowed to use a very simplified model, which of course costs much less com uh, in computational time to study the large uh, uh, amplitude of the system, largest amplitude of the system. So this is an interesting, of course, uh, result from a computational point of view. Now, you, you, what, what is this mode? For example, if you want to move from the open state to the closed state, so you have the substrate binding domain, which is open, and the final state is the one which, where it's closed corresponding to a state where uh, ATP is hydrolyzed and then you have IDP in the binding pocket. So this mode has a, freq has a frequency of 84 gigahertz and this quantity uh, in fact measure qualitatively uh, the contribution of each normal mode to uh, transition between the open to the closed state assuming simply that this quantity reflect the scalar product of the eigenvector of the mode on a virtual path, which is a simple linear path between the open states and closed states. Of course, the linear path is not a realistic one. And so this quantity is just qualitative, but it reveals that, it reveals that in fact, this mode is a mode contributing quite a lot to the opening or closing, in fact, of the substrate binding domain. And in fact, you have here a representation of this mode or the displacement of the different part of the of the system. And you see that indeed this low frequency mode has tendency to close the substrate binding domain as expected. Now, if we look at the reverse transition, you start from a closed state, you see it, these two parts are close to each other. And the lowest frequency mode is 37 gigahertz. But you see that if you want to, if you try to compute the contribution of these different modes to a transition from the closed states to the open state, you have a distribution of mode. There is no very dominant mode. Maybe this one is, is the most important, but it means that the, 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 the motion, the, the, the jump from the closed state to the open state is not so simple. You need to reorganize different parts of the protein to reach this open state. The motion from the open state to the closed state is much simpler. So there is no symmetry between the two transitions and not the same mode, of course, contributing to the initiation of this transition. A comparison between all atom and uh, coarse grain model are really quite, quite similar. So if we try to summarize what we can learn by applying normal mode analysis to this nanomachine, we see that uh, when you are in open state, we have an acoustical mode, which is 84 gigahertz, where the main motion are a tendency to close the substrate binding domain and a motion here, which is uh, corresponds to a tendency to open the nuclide binding domain in order to have the, the exchange of the nucleate, nucleotide, ATP, by ADP. When you look at the, the other transition from the closed state or from the state which is called APO without nucleotide, you see that you have three main uh, uh, modes. One are 37 gigahertz, 97 and 100 26 gigahertz, and the main message is that, of course, we have a, a motion here, which try to open the substrate binding domain, but in the same time, uh, with the motion of this part of the nuclide binding domain, or it means that we have a kind of communication between the, this part of the protein and this part of the protein, which are about 100 angstrom apart, because the normal mode couple the different part of the protein, and precisely this typical motion is observed in NMR 
uh, when there is exchange of the nucleotide. So I think this simple normal mode calculation give you some hints about which kind of motion are important to initiate the change from a global minimum to another global minimum. So here from an open state to a closed states. But of course, they are just the preliminary steps of the motion because you have to cross an activation barrier, which is probably huge in this system. And so uh, if we want to go a step further and try to understand all the, for example, the binding of ATP induce finally a change uh, from one global minimum to another, we have to go beyond normal mode analysis and is what I will present next using the concept of free energy landscape. So we move from a, a dynamics which is descri described by Newton law by a stochastic dynamics. But you will see that in this approach of free energy landscape, we can still uh, talk about collective mode. The collective mode are stochastic mode, but they can be obtained by using uh, a technique which is principal coupon analysis, which has a very strong link with the normal mode analysis. Is sometimes called quasi anharmonic uh, analysis, but this term is probably not, not the, the right one. Uh, before going to the free energy landscape, yes, I would like to just show you the calculation of the infrared spectra. At least it's a prediction of the infrared spectra for the open state and closed state for the acoustical mode of HSP70 with two different force fields. They, 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 they give the similar results. And you can see that here we have a parameter, which is the damping. Of course, when you do a normal mode uh, calculation, if you use a simple force harmonic oscillator model, you have to introduce a damping, the dissipation of energy, which is a free parameter of your, your calculation. So you can take a very small value like this, 3 gigahertz, and then the peak of the different mode, the peak corresponding to different modes, are of course very narrow. If you increase the damping, you have, of course, an increase of the width uh, of, the exit, of the peak corresponding to the excitation. Uh, but you see that even if you have 3 gigahertz, 30 gigahertz, or even 300 gigahertz uh, as a parameter, so we have two order magnitude here, we can still distinguish between the closed states and the open states. So this is very promising, but it means that we could detect the different step of the conformational change by following the acoustical mode. Another thing to note is that in this regime, we are in the over damped regime. And because of this, you have a shift of the frequency, not only an increase of the width, but also a shift of the frequency. But even in this regime, we can still observe something and we can still distinguish between the two states of the nanomachine. So this is summarized here, mm -hmm. when the protein is moving from one state open to the closed states by exchanging the nucleotide. In principle, we should be able to follow this phenomena by measuring, in fact, the frequency below 300 gigahertz. <coughs> Sorry. So now I move to the free energy landscape concept and uh, the conformational dynamics. So now, if I want to represent the free energy in general of proteins, uh, you have, of course, the native state, so the folded state, and this is the free energy, this is the global minimum. You can have intermediate state, misfolded state, which leads to aggregate, and so this misfolding disease. The chaperones, in fact, help the misfolded protein and, and unfolded protein to fold correctly to the native state. And the present chaperon HSP70 occurs in two main states, open and closed. Now, of course, this is a cartoon, but now we would like to, to uh, make this cartoon quantitative and transform this, this uh, cartoon in a quantitative uh, uh, picture and have some coordinates uh, along which I can compute the free energy. I can also, uh, also identify the minima uh, the global minima, the local minima of these two conformational states. And so the question is which coordinates uh, I need to use to, to describe the free energy landscape. And uh, an harmonic 
dynamics than moving to global minimum to another global minimum of, of this protein. Okay, in our group, we develop uh, these coordinates. We represent, in fact, uh, the main chain of a protein only by the C alpha. Okay, and with uh, four C alpha, you can define a dihedral angle gamma, and this dihedral angle gamma is in fact the equivalent of a local torsion of a curve. And we can define also an angle theta, which is an, an angle, a bond angle between three C alpha. So we have see two pseudo bonds. And this angle theta is the equivalent of the local curvature of, of a main chain. And so we extract this core, coarse grain coordinate theta and gamma from all atom MD simulations. So we perform all atom MD simulations and we extract theta and gamma from the all atom MD simulation to have a representation of, of the free energy landscape of the system along these coordinates. As, as you see, you can have a coordinate theta and gamma for each residue. So we can define a free energy uh, potential of mean force, so a local free energy, for example, along gamma, just by using a simple Boltzmann law, so minus kT logarithm for the probability density function of this gamma. So you compute the probability density function of every gamma, and then you have a local projection of the free energy landscape on each residue along the sequence. So you have a sequence of free energy landscape projection. And if you do uh, if you do this, as you will see, you will be able to detect where in the sequence you observe a change of the free energy landscape due, for example, to interaction with a ligand or due to a mutation in a protein. So you have a representation of the free energy landscape projected along the sequence. This is the main message. So, of course, to extract this theta and gamma, we need to do an bias MD simulation, all atom and, uh, and bias MD simulation. So, we did this simulation for HSP70, and we did it in three states without nucleotide, with ADP bond in the nuclide binding domain, and with ATP bond in the nuclide binding domain. And we did the simulation for time scale about uh, 500 to 1 microsecond, as far as I remember. Uh, this is one of the force fields we use, but uh, we use different force fields. And of course, the problem is that you need to compute uh, this system for a long time because it's a huge system in a very large box because it's a large system. It's about 10 nanometer long, so it's computationally expensive. And then you have this uh, horrible diagram where you have the free energy landscape projected on the gamma coordinate here along the sequence. And because you have 600 amino acids, of course, you have a lot of one dimensional free energy landscape. What is interesting is that you can, of course, compute all these one dimensional free energy profiles in three states without nucleotide, with ADP, and with ATP. So the idea is to compare every one-dimensional free energy profile in a different conformational state to detect where are the mo most important change in the free energy landscape in terms of position along the sequence. So I give you an example because it's more easy to understand with an example. This is one of the gamma angle which is important in the conformational change from open state to, to the closed states is the gamma 387. This is the free energy landscape, uh, the one dimensional free energy profile uh, along this coordinate in the ADP state, when ADP is bound to the nuclide binding domain. In green, this is the free energy profile when ATP is bound in the nuclide binding domain. And in red is when no nucleotide are bond in nuclear binding domain. And now for every one dimensional comparison of one dimensional profile like this, along the sequence, we define a metric to quantify how much is different this, this uh, different one dimensional profile. For example, here in this example, 
the comparison between without nucleotide, APO, and with ADP give a metric of 74% of similarity. You can see by eyes that it's quite, they are quite similar, even they are not equivalent. And the metric gave us these following numbers for the comparison between the without nucleotide and with ATP. ATP and ADP is about zero. It means that the similarity between the green, the blue and the red is negligible. Of course, it's obvious in this case, but we, we did this calculation automatically for all one dimensional profile along the sequence. And so we can quantify, in fact, the similarity between the free energy profile and detect which one are modified when the protein is in one global minimum or another. So you can detect where are the important change in the protein in terms of free energy along the sequence when the protein is moving from one global minimum to another. So we can say that the, 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 this, the position where we find a, a lot of differences are the position involved in the communication between the nuclear binding domain and supraclear binding domain. Because remember that the nucleotide bond in one side of the system and it, it has an effect on the other side on the substrate binding domain. So you need to have some communication across the system. OK, and surprisingly, we got only 27 of this angle, gamma angle, which are really very different in the different uh, nucleotide states of the protein. So in the different global minima of the protein. And we had about 500 data which could be uh, considered to be converged. So it's a, a small number. In, in the other hand, it means that to, to describe the change from one state global minimum to another, you need a space of 27 dimension at this moment. And they are the distribution of the main important player in the in the motion from one global minimum open state to another global minimum closed state. And you see that they are spread over the structure. They are not only localized in the region where you have a nucleotide which will bind, but some are very far from this region. It means that all these uh, residues are some all connected to each other in some special collective way. And so these 27 points are needed to, for the protein, are needed to collaborate for the protein to, me, to move from one global minimum to another. So this I, I will discuss if you want later on. We could uh, compare uh, all these different positions were correlated to different experiment, biochemical experiment, consisting mainly to mutation, uh, testing the allosteri of, of, of the protein. It means communication between the two states. And we were successful uh, because we were agreeing with uh, all the experiment and predict some, some, some result. But now I will, I would like to insist more on, on a different point because we were talking about uh, vibrational modes and acoustical mode in the first part. And I told you that, in fact, of course, normal modes are collective modes, so they are localized in the protein. Uh, here we move our picture to a more localized uh, description. We have a local free energy profile along the sequence. But we know that these free energy profile are not independent to each other. So even if the system has 27 dimensions, these 27 degrees of freedom, which are very important, are not independent of each other. They are connected to each other. And so it would be nice to build a collective representation of the motion of the, of the distribution uh, of these 27 degrees of freedom. So we are looking for collective coordinates. We are really equivalent uh, to the um, normal coordinates. The normal coordinates are collective coordinates, and we are looking for the collective coordinate here also. 
And we analyze, in fact, one MD trajectory in particular. It's a one unbiased MD trajectory where we had ATP. We start with uh, uh, completely uh, closed states and we by hand had ATP in the nuclide binding uh, pocket and observe what happens. And we were lucky to observe a conformational change from a closed state to a nearly completely open state. And so we analyzed this trajectory uh, with these eyes of the free energy landscape uh, concept. And that's what we, we, we did to, I mean, build a collective representation of, of the motion. We transform the gamma coordinate, which is the coarse grain diagonal angle, in a vector. This is necessary because when you have uh, angular coordinates, and if you want to define a metric, you are obliged to move to a vector in the space. So we define the vector here, where cosine and sine are the coordinates uh, of the vector, and gamma is the angle i corresponding to a position in the sequence. So ui is a vector associated to one residue along the sequence. And we were observing the variation of this quantity relative to its average. We built the covariance matrix and we diagonalized the covariance matrix. This is typically what is called, and you probably know very well, the principal component analysis. And from this com principal component analysis, you can extract a collective coordinate, which is the principal component, which corresponds to the projection of the fluctuation of the vector on the eigenvector vector of the board. And of course, we are interested by the board, we have, which has, which have, sorry, the low eigenvalue corresponding to the lowest eigenfrequency of the system. And in this way, we can build now a free energy landscape, which, which is only in two dimensions. The two dimensions are no two collective coordinate, the principal component one and the principal component two. So now we represent the motion from the initial state. You put ATP, ATP is here, to the final state where the system is compact. So you see you have a closed state and you end up with a state which is nearly completely open and you move to different intermediate state. And this is the most stable state, and the system escaped from these states along the trajectory. So this is a non-equilibrium analysis with collective coordinate PC1, PC2, which represent the equivalent of the eigenvector 1 and vector 2 of the two lowest frequency modes of the system. This is the equivalent in a, in a non-linear and non-equilibrium uh, uh, dynamics to uh, the two lowest frequency mode in the harmonic approximation. Okay, but now uh, I present you, I presented you two, two different pictures of the free energy landscape. One where I have a local picture along the sequence and now I have a collective representation. Of course, the two can be connected. What we did is to uh, build now the pathway of the minimum free energy corresponding to the trajectory. So we move now from a two-dimensional representation in collective coordinate, coordinates to a one-dimensional profile, but this one now has to be considered as a collective free energy representation of the system. It follows simply the paths of minimum free energy. And now I can identify the different states by which the system is moving. And I can make a connection and look what happens in my space of 27 dimensions when I move from one point to another point by a collective motion. We start from the initial state, and here you have the 27 important uh, free energy profiles, so the 27th important uh, amino acid playing a role in the global change from one state uh, in, the, in the motion from one global minimum to another. So I start from the initial state and you will see that only three players are involved. When I move from one 
to the saddle point, to the initial point, to the saddle point. And what happens? If you look carefully, you see that this amino acid is moving from one local minima to another. And the three are coupled, these three are coupled, and they, this corresponds to this collective motion. Then I move to another place, and then this will be the three players. You see, again, you have a change in this local, uh, from this global minima, no, to a local minima, sorry, to a local minima, okay? And so on. So you can follow the motion around the free energy profile, and you can see that each time you have a jump from one local minima to a no local minima, and a jump from a global, a local minima of the global free energy profile to another one. So here you have a, a representation which is extracted from a collective mode representation based on principal component analysis. And here you have a representation which is based on a projection of the free energy landscape on local degrees of freedom. And of course, when you see a global ch a change from one minimum to another, like this one, for example, okay, this is a, not a motion on, the, on a potential energy function, but on a free energy uh, profile. So it means that you moving from a, an ensemble of local, a local ensemble of microstates to another ensemble of microstates. So it's a stochastic motion. So it's a difficult. It's why it's difficult to understand completely uh, the conformational change from one global minimum like the open state to the closed states in terms of deterministic model. Because what happens in, in reality is a change of probability density, which is extremely difficult to see by eyes on a computer, for example, because it's a result of an integration of a, a period of time. So now I hope that I, I, I shown you uh, connection between the harmonic approximation and the acoustical mode, which initiate, in fact, uh, uh, motion uh, between different global uh, minima of a more complicated protein, and the concept of free energy landscape, where we can also introduce a collective mode corresponding to motion between different global or local uh, minima. So in conclusion, uh, I would say that uh, the acoustical mode of protein reproduced by normal mode analysis uh, are still waiting for further experimental evidences because we have only few evidences for three, three proteins. The acoustical mode may serve as probe of time-dependent conformational dynamics, like uh, the example of HSP70, where we could follow, in fact, conformational change from one global minimum to another. And uh, I, I show you how a free energy landscape can be used to uh, examine in more detail the conformational dynamics of a complicated system. And I would like, of course, to uh, thank my collaborator, in particular, Adrien Nicolai, who is the main contributor uh, to the work I presented today, and Patrice Delarue, who, who is also assistant professor in our group. And part of the work was done also by a PhD student, Fatima Barakat. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. It was very, very interesting. I was caught by oh, in every slide. <laughs> very interesting. So um, I'm, let's see if, if there are some questions from from attendees. I have quite some questions actually. Maybe I can start then. So for attendees, if you like, uh, please type your question into the chat or raise your hand. Meanwhile, I'll uh, okay. I see Christian. Christian is okay. The question. So hopefully this time I, it will work fine. I will allow microphone and camera for you, Christian. Just a second. Hello, camera, and you should be working now, Chris.
so there's no micro i think <laughs> we had this thing last time right try now chris you can unmute Weird. I, I don't see him in the attendees. Maybe his connection dropped. Yeah, anyway. So let me start the questions. Hopefully, other, if some people can follow up. So I was struck by the, in the beginning of your, in the first part of your uh, presentation, you mentioned that surprisingly, in all three proteins, it was the positively charged residues, residues is contributed to the dipole uh, changes. So I mean, why? why? Is it is it just a coincidence, or is it something particular about that? Which is, have you have you thought about it? There is why is it so? Yes, we we thought about it, and uh, well, arginine lies in a long chain. Okay. And so I I think uh, that's the only explanation we 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 found really for the moment, uh, because I think that there is a difference of three angstrom between, uh, as far as I remember, yes. There is about, uh, I don't see if you see my slide. Yes. Yes, uh, there is a difference about uh, three angstrom between the negative and the positive. So they have longer chain. So dipole, of course, is the product of charge by the length. So we think that this is probably the reason. Uh, and of course, the other amino acids are not charged, so the contribution are very weak. So. so mainly the positive and negative are the most important, but the positive are the most even more important. For the, we believe for that reason. Okay, okay, I see. So it's mainly because of the length of the residue, not necessarily, well, of course, it has to be charged too, but it has to be long as well. Okay, okay, I see, I see. This could be tested experimentally, of course. Of course, know. yeah, it's interesting. Uh, one more thing <clears throat> regarding the, the ear, the extranoria, the acoustic. <laughs> Spectroscopy. So I'm, it's very fascinating paper from the from the Gordon's lab. I'm just curious about the uh, interpretation, of course, as you mentioned. But one thing which you mentioned is that um, regarding the tr the optical trap stiffness and the force acting on that. So I didn't quite get it because I thought it's like quite opposite. So imagine that the at particular frequencies the polarizability is higher. Show that also the force should be higher there. So shouldn't shouldn't the RMS the root mean square uh, function should be lower? You see what I mean? Uh, the instead of being higher. Yeah, but I I think the, the idea was that there is a you need to go higher the electric field, and so if you change the polarizability, then then um, I, I think you can induce a motion, and then of course the protein will be stabilized. Ah, I see. So that's what you. That's mean. the idea, but. Uh, frankly saying, this is what we, we propose, but uh, uh, it's still unclear. You see, even if you know the, the, the paper, it, it's really unclear what, what is the mechanism. And from yeah, yeah, we, we observe, we said, okay, maybe it's a combined combination of change of polarizability and, and infrared excitation. But okay. to, 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 to go further, we should have more uh, direct connection to the experiment. So. Somebody would, would repeat the experiment, and we could control different parameters in parallel with theory and, and experiment. But unfortunately, there is no other <laughs> measurement up to now. To my yeah, not, not on these proteins and not on these frequencies. I get there are some from uh, uh, Andrea Markels regarding the <clears throat> it's, it's most close to the terahertz, and it's not not clear if these are yeah. the low frequency modes or some higher frequency modes. But the proteins there is also smaller. So it could be that they are going really high in the frequency. So it could be a case. So I see there is a question from James Krieger. Let's hope it will work for him if I make him <clears throat> a presenter. Can you, James Krieger, can you try to unmute and ask? Hello, does this Hello. work? So I was wondering in the last part where you have the MD simulations, how, how long were these simulations? Did you, did you check whether there's some dependency on 
the duration of them for the results or whether they're converged or anything like that. I, you are talking about convergence of, of, of the result, right? Uh, using the yeah. patients. Yeah, in fact, uh, if you do MD simulation and, and you do instantaneous normal load calculation, this is what we did also, which is not presented, then of course uh, you you have a certain, uh, um, I would say not damping, but you have a distribution of the frequency. Uh, of course, the, the local minima are always different, so you have a shift, for example, of the first mode, the low, lower bond of the spectra, a little bit is, is shifting, okay? And you can collect a distribution of, of, of the, this frequency. But this does not change, to, does not change the, the main results. And it's not enough to explain the, the, the damping. I mean, it's just a part, of course, of the, of the noise we can have, because in solution, of course, the protein is always changing. So the normal mode approximation should be valid only in a crystal <laughs> and not in solution. So, but that, that's a way to do it. But uh, when you do MD simulation, uh, I mean, uh, you can do MD simulation. Typically, I think we did 100 nanoseconds or something like that of MD simulation. You have the statistic in fact. You know? okay. We have low frequency, but they're not so low. Still giga. <laughs> Thank you for the, for the question. So, uh, if I may ask, uh, Patrick, I have one more question regarding on a slide 18. If you can show it, there was a um, yes. Yeah. Yes. So I, I was curious here. So mm, this is very important methodically. Uh, how far we can go with the coarse grain model? So uh, I'm wondering this criterion which you mentioned that well, this is maybe empiric maybe only valid for the particular force fields and particular proteins but you mentioned it's it's on, based on this graph that there is good over obviously overlap of the coarse grain model and uh, and all atom till 300 gigahertz so i was wondering um what are the what do you think are the reasons why it's 300 gigahertz why if you have let's say smaller proteins isn't it just the mode number or is it really the wavelength comparison to the protein size which only matters or you know if it's only if it's the number of the mode, let's say first 10, I don't know, or here will be first 30, or is it really the the wavelength to or size of the protein? Do you want do, do you mean what I do you see what I mean? I see, I see what you mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see what you mean. Um, yeah, I think it it is it, probably related to the size also. Yeah, certainly related to the size. Uh, because uh, of course, uh, the wavelength, the maximum wavelength, will depends on the on the radius of the system, and so if you imagine that the protein becomes very extremely small, then the coarse grain model will will fail probably when it becomes extremely small. So I was uh, talking about system uh, between five, ten nanometer, and more more or less ten nanometer. Uh, if you have a protein of two nanometer, I think it is different probably different. So um, in this case, 300 gigahertz was, was a good, I mean, good limit. Uh, but if the system is, is even more larger, um, I think it's, it's really related to the quantification of, of, of the weights in the, in the system. So it's related to the size. But probably above, above four or five nanometer, uh, it probably works. But if you go down, indeed, cause game model can can fail. That is true, probably. I, we didn't check, so I, I will not firmly say that. But the argument was the fact that, of course, if you have the lowest um, modes, uh, then the, the the size of the vibration is of the other magnitude of the of, of the molecule. So if you have already 10, 20 uh, um, C alpha C alpha bonds, it works. If you have three, four, five, maybe. <laughs> but I think for most of the protein, it will be okay. It's a good question. But indeed, if you are looking for a very small protein like TFPK or very small peptide, then you should be careful because uh, probably it does not work. Yeah. Thank you. So I think Chris raised the hand. Maybe it could work for him. 
Chris, now I sh you should be presenter, so we could maybe unmute Cristiano if you are there available. Hi. How it works? Yeah, good. Yeah. I was guessing about the the role of water. When you put the water in your modeling, is just damping the frequency, changing the frequency? Is it bounded water? Is uh, free water? I'm yeah. guessing how how does it goes in 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 the results? Yeah, please. Uh, in fact, uh, if you compute the normal modes for a protein in vacuum, so you remove all the waters, there are several problems. First, uh, you can have problems of convergence because of the force field, but it's a technical problem. But from a point of view of physics, then, then for example, you will see clearly that the alpha helix and beta sheet in, in the secondary structure and protein are not uh, in agreement with experiment because they are not for example, in alpha helix, the angle uh, characterizing the alpha helix are not longer true. And so, um, because uh, water around the protein, maybe the first second layer of water, uh, is a part of the system. I mean, the, when the protein folds, the hydrophobic chain should move inside because of water. So. If you remove water and do the calculation in vacuum, then, then there, is, there are problems from, from the beginning. And of course, how much water you have to include, I would say the first iteration layer is necessary. And of course, you froze it in, a, in normal mode calculation. So you could repeat the calculation with different uh, instant time in the MD simulation and take the average, for example. And, and uh, so, I think it's the minimal, the minimal model is to include the water because it has a huge effect on the, especially on the acoustical mode. No, uh, there is a, a drawback of normal mode uh, analysis, uh, the way we did and the way people uh, do in general, is that uh, we don't take into account completely the full solvent, I mean the dielectric medium uh, which represents the solvent. And so the next step would be to, to, for example, include the continuum model of water, so a dielectric constant of 80, and, and if possible, a dielectric constant which is frequency dependent <laughs> in the infrared. And I think it's a part of the shift, probably is a part of the shift we observe between the calculation and the experiment of Gordon. Uh, but this is not easy to do. I did something like that for phonons uh, in the past in my thesis. Uh, but it was more easy because it's a two-dimensional crystal system. Here we are in, in the liquid. But probably there are some also... Uh, you, you should not expect to have agreement between the protein with a layer of water and the experiment. You should have a shift because of this effect. Uh, it's difficult to predict, but uh, the same if the molecule is on the surface. Then uh, you have a dipole of, of uh, excited dipole as an image dipole in the, in the substrate due to the polarization of the substrate, which modify according to the orientation of the molecule on the surface, the excitation. Okay. I see, I see, thank you. I have one more question, um, which we also thought about in our analysis regarding the a connection of uh, eigenvalues from, uh, well, yeah, how conceptually connect the uh, eigenvalues from PCA, so principal component analysis, and eigenvalues, that means directed frequencies, from normal mode analysis. It's, it's of course, PCA is well, unharmonic by the principle, but what would you say is, uh, uh, is it a way how to connect, you know, what, you are, what I'm addressing? What yeah. will be the f effective frequency or frequency range of PCA, first principal component, if it's an like important component, let's say? Yeah, yeah, yeah. In fact, there is a connection between the two, because uh, if you are in the harmonic approximation uh, and you do PCA, so it means that uh, the protein is, is close to, to uh, the global minimum, there is normally an exact relation between the frequency of PCA and vibration of frequency, and at least the eigenvalue, you can demonstrate, because I did this, because I asked myself the same question, uh, the eigenvector of PCA and the eigenvector of, of uh, normal mode should be the same. But for the frequency, 
there is a paper by Go a long long time ago where he, he, he obtains similar or uh, an exact relation between vibrational frequency and frequency in PCA uh, numerically, but uh, there is an exact relation which was verified. O however, we could not repeat with Adrian we try, we could not repeat this result. We try everything possible, we could not repeat it. Uh, we could not find this relation. Uh, and there is a deviation, and we are still thinking about that this deviation uh, and this origin is still obscure. But you can demonstrate mathematically that the eigenvector should be the same, and this is absurd. But for the frequency, I would not say that the, the relation is wrong. Normally, on the paper, it's, it's right. But numerically, you cannot find it. So, probably the reason is more profound, uh, and it might be related to initial conditions, it might be related to the fact you use a thermostat, it might be many things possible. Yeah. At this moment, to be honest, we didn't find the, I, the final answer, but we cannot reproduce the result, and the frequency are only approximately related to the vibrational frequency that are the conclusion. But the eigenvector are the same. Yeah. Of course, they are the same if the system is harmonic enough. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. And do you have any um, any standard tests for harmonicity, so to say? Uh, or how how are you testing the method? I'm just curious about the methods because it's very also interesting and important for us. Well, uh, <laughs> Acoustical mode normally uh, they have uh, they have an unharmonic free energy profile. <laughs> that's the problem. Yes, <laughs> yes, that that is the point because we found from from the beginning it's that it's yeah. Is there any conditions actually that they, they are it can be can be considered at all harmonic? <laughs> no, it's, it's not it's not clear because uh, indeed the, the 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 problem is that they are they are often they are anharmonic. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I I think. This is a question of time scale, I would say. Okay. So uh, we we were working also on the autocorrelation function uh, point of view. Uh, this is now unpublished, and, and we are still working on that on the side. But probably it's, it's a question of time scale. So if you excite a system for a short time or long time, you observe the system for a long time, then uh, the system. The, 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 the mode can can move to another mode. I think if the anharmonicity, uh, the lifetime of the mode is finite, and that may be uh, also a problem. Uh, yeah. I, I, so it's why the Gordon experiment is extremely surprising also, because it has been done at room temperature, uh, as far as I remember. So and you could observe this mode. And, and in many places in the literature, you find that the mode should be over temp and not observed. And if you, so th that is two problems, the over damping and anomalicity. And if you look at the uh, not one scattering experiment uh, done in the 70s and 80s, uh, there is no uh, uh, mode uh, below 20, 20 centimeters minus one. Except the real one scattering I shown, but uh, so it's about ten more. So it's it's uh, terahertz. It's not in the hundred of gigahertz. So. Yeah, yeah. So this this good question. I think uh, we should find a way to characterize that in a more realistic way, uh, expect, theoretically and experimentally. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. It's very interesting. I think I exhausted my immediate questions. There is one more, just just fascination. It's not already comment and fascination that, especially for your HSP70 protein, it's it's so visual that there is a nucleotide binding domain and a linker, very well, just pep, just basically one unstructured part probably, and there is a then there is a uh, the substrate binding domain. And it's very interesting for me, like in this, you know, plastic, plastic, elastic world of proteins, that even this very short linker can connect, or is it only the linker or the water around it, which actually connects the, the two parts, which are, it seems to me mechanically, it's very weakly linked and still yeah. they yeah. control each other. I mean, yeah, but uh, um, I, I didn't put the video in, in the talk, but we have a video for 
the trajectory of HSP-70 and MD simulation, for example, you observe that the two domains stay apart if you don't include the uh, ATP. And even if you include the ATP, some trajectory does not change because the time scale is, is not enough in the MD simulation. And, and so the linker alone probably cannot play the role. It's all the system. So the water run, uh, as I said, the water is important. So that is a, this maintain for you the system. And uh, otherwise, the domain will attract each other and the system will not stay there. But when the, when the protein move from the ATP, uh, when ATP binds, then the liquor binds itself in, in a cavity on the nuclear binding domain. And this stabilizes also the suicide binding domain, which binds also to nuclear binding domain. So this, this flexible linker is able to, which is a peptide, is able to fold in a cavity mm -hmm. when there is a conformation of change. And it's maintained like this uh, when there is no nuclear binding. And so this way, it's quite interesting that you have some communication. You see, you have the binding on one side and change the length one time at a further distance. But the acoustical mode show a part of, of, of this. When you compute the acoustical mode in normal mode analysis, you see that you have a change in nuclear binding domain, which is connected to a motion 100 times from the part. So even if the simple model, this harmonic approximation is very simple, it catches some, some information. Hmm. Interesting. Hmm. But this HSP-70 protein will be interesting to test experimentally. So we are looking for experimentalists <laughs> because we have people here which are experts to produce pure protein, human mm -hmm. proteins. And, and you see this protein could be followed according to the theory, of course, uh, from one state to another. And this okay. protein is an up in a cell. It's not an anonymous protein. It has 100 functions in the cell. Yeah, it's a very important one, right? It exists in all cells in, uh, on the herd. So it's a very important system. And we, we, we try to find experimentalists to do measurement of, of low frequency mode of that system because you have a nice system which can, which is a machine, because you said that you are working in a machine, so. Yeah, kind of, just be so. Uh, in, in different contexts, uh, something similar could be interesting. I was wondering, so imagine that you are like the, well, you are actually a master of that, I mean, god of the world in the MD simulations, right? You can see speed and, uh, and energy of every, well, velocity and energy of every atom in full atom. So I was we were wondering that, in these crucial transition phenomena, well, conformational changes, uh, unfolding steps, and so on. So, in the simulations, basically, you see what were the, what was the, um, what was the energy and velocity of atoms when that was happening, right? So, couldn't one potentially, I mean, pre preset the the initial conditions, well. Man manually or somehow automatized way that you would prime the protein to 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 actually do the thing you want it to do to be to to probe it in this sensitive region where it could transit. You see what I mean? That that. Yes, I see. But uh, it, as far as I as I remember, it does not work because um, uh, when you are start, for example, with the same velocity, uh, the trajectory in, in this simulation are quickly diverging. Uh, because it's a chaotic system. Sure. And, and, and so I think uh, this does not work, but you can buy us, of course, you can buy us with some uh, uh, bias MD simulation, then you introduce some, some bias from some coordinates or some potential. Uh, but with the velocity alone, uh, I don't think so. Maybe you have to try large velocity, we didn't try. Shock. Mm -hmm. sure. <laughs> Uh, I, I don't think because the, the, the trajectory are quickly diverging, so I think it will not work. Okay. That's a problem. It's also an ensemble. You see, we start different trajectories with ATP, and because it's a Boltzmann law, in fact, many trajectories will not, on the self, on given time scale, ends to the finite state. Only a certain number, which is the probability in this time scale, to get it. So. And the problem is the computational time for this system. You see, it's a very large system. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, interesting. Okay, okay. Thank you very much. I think we, we exhausted uh, well ourselves and attendees for the questions. So uh, I think this is this is all. So thank you. Very I would much. like to thank you very much. I thank you. We very enjoyed this one. And as we discussed, we'll send you the recording to check, and then we'll see.